Back in the 1980s, when I was teaching at McGill, I invited my good friend Hillel Halkin, whom some of you may know from the pages, uh, from the website of Mosaic, to speak to one of my classes. <clears throat> and introducing him as a writer and a translator, I wanted to pay him the supreme compliment. So I said he was one of our finest intellectuals. And Hillel then began his remarks by assuring the class with obvious distaste for the term that he was not an intellectual. And when recently asked about it, he said he'd never considered the term intellectual a badge of honor. And he explained, intellectuals are people who deal in ideas. And ideas, if merely dealt in, aren't worth much. They become valuable only when lived. And there are only so many ideas that a serious person can live or try to live in a lifetime, maybe two or three. Maybe a few more, but certainly not enough to qualify as an intellectual. So in other words, he had no patience for theorists, for thinkers whose ideas are not rooted in experience. And actually, I must say, I fully share Hillel's suspicion of ideas merely dealt in rather than lived. And in fact, they remind me very strongly of what the Passover Haggadah warns us against. The traditional Haggadah that we read on Passover encourages, as you know, endless debate and questions, but it tells us not to overvalue intellect as an end in itself. Even though we are all wise, full of understanding, though we are all elders, well-versed in the Torah, we are still under the commandment to tell the story of the departure from Egypt. And the more we tell the story of the departure from Egypt, the more praiseworthy we are. In other words, our cerebral activity is there only for the sake of reliving the national exodus from Egypt, and the ideas are basically there to guide and reinvigorate the Jewish people. So when we boast of the great minds that emerged from Jewish ranks in the modern period, we have to acknowledge among them the new class of thinkers, of intellectuals, who assumed that their social innovations were an improvement over the Jewish way of life. Now, Isaac Babel, who was a generation younger than Ansky, joined the new Soviet regime after the Bolshevik Revolution. And during the Russian-Polish War of 1920, much of which was fought in an area with a large Jewish population, he served in the Cossack Regiment of the Red Army. And then he wrote a series of stories, Red Cavalry, based on his adventures. In the seventh story of our series, our narrator speaks for the first time as a Jew. On the eve of the Sabbath, I am always tormented by the dense sorrow of memory. In the past on these evenings, my grandfather's yellow beard caressed the volumes of Ibn Ezra. My old grandmother, in her lace bonnet, waved spells over the Sabbath candle with her gnarled fingers and sobbed sweetly. On those evenings, my child's heart was gently rocked like a little boat on enchanted waves. Now in this sweet spirit of nostalgia, he looks for a Jew with whom to spend the Sabbath, and he finds a kindly elderly shopkeeper named Gedalia. Gedalia is grateful to the communists for saving him from the Poles, but he cannot understand why these soldiers of the revolution then confiscated his gramophone and threatened to shoot him when he protested. Gedalia confronts the narrator. You say the Pole shot because he is the counter-revolution, and you shoot because you are the revolution. But revolution is happiness. The revolution is the good deed done by good men. But good men do not kill. Hence, the revolution is done by bad men. But the Poles are also bad men. Who is going to tell Gedalia which is the revolution and which the counter-revolution? So you see, Babel puts into the mouth of this elderly Jew the damning condemnation that he cannot afford to express in his own name. Though the story is in Russian, we know that they are speaking Yiddish because Gedalia asks, with what do you eat it? The Yiddish way of asking, how can I understand the revolution? 
And in the same idiom, Babel's narrator replies, this same man with all that longing for the Sabbaths, you eat it with gunpowder seasoned with the finest blood. The revolution must shoot because it is the revolution. The two may be speaking a Jewish language, but the soldier is no longer speaking as a Jew. For all his sentimentality, the smart young Jew in this story is helping to put Judaism to death.